All right, everybody, we are talking multi-agent systems today, and we are talking about agents so that everybody can understand. Uh, Wiz, I got a quick question. I wonder if you can help me out real quick as we get started today. Um, are agents just tools? No, Greg. Are agents just rules? No, Greg. Then are agents just about this reasoning thing? I hate to I hate to be a negative Nancy this early in the morning, but no, <laughs> no, they are not. Are agents all of that and more? Yes, that that's the one. Got it. Okay, we're coming back to you as we continue our journey, agents for everyone today. Uh, thanks, Wiz. We'll try to get a handle on all this as we jump into the sesh. We are excited to present a really cool use case that hopefully you got the flavor of on the intro today. So as we align our aim for the day, we wanna make sure that by the end of this session, you guys understand what multi-agent workflows are all about as a prototyping pattern. And we wanna help you actually understand how to build these, but more specifically, we're gonna show you a quick use case. And if you wanna go super deep into how to build, we've got lots of resources available for you to potentially check out later. If you have questions along the way, please do use the Zoom live chat. We'll be monitoring and taking questions along the way also at the end of the sesh. Okay, so first off, let's, recover the patterns of Gen AI that build up to agents. And then we can sort of expand our idea of agents into multi-agent frameworks and multi-agent tools before we build our multi-agent app. The first thing that's important to understand everybody is that agent, agent-like, agentic. These are triple equals exactly the same thing. Don't let anybody make you feel stupid by using bigger, fancier versions of these words. They are not bigger nor fancier, okay? Feel free to use them at will in whichever way you'd like. The important thing to understand about agents is not the specific thing that they are, but that generally what we're talking about is we're talking about a pattern, a pattern that sort of represents what we can do with agents. So we're gonna to try to get a handle on this from a number of different viewpoints today. In order to understand the pattern of agents, we need to understand the patterns of generative AI that lead us into agents. And of course, at the bottom, potentially even at the top of the hierarchy, we talk about prompting. This is to lead to do something, to prompt, to instruct, Done well, we might call prompting sort of teaching, even training. This leads us into the second pattern of generative AI, which is fine tuning. Also training, right? And this is about teaching for real how the LLM should behave, how we want it to act. We can sort of move from one shot, two shot, few shot, over many examples in the context window into fine tuning as we move down the task specific spectrum. Of course, the third pattern is RAG, retrieval augmented generation. And this is all about giving the LLM access to new knowledge. Now, prompting, fine tuning, RAG, we come now to our good friend, the agent. And yes, a lot of people are talking about giving the LLMs access to tools. We're hearing a lot about using function calling, about leveraging the OpenAI functions API to access different tools. This is very much a type of agent. That is true. But we wanna sort of expand the frame on what we can do with agents and how we can think about agents. Agents is not a new idea, it's not a new word. It's a very old word and it's a very old idea. This is a book that I really enjoyed from a number of years ago 
quite long ago telling the story of an up and coming research lab in the early in the mid 20th century where they were focused on studying complexity and anytime you see people studying complexity you see the word agents agents they might be neurons neurons form brains they might be companies companies form economies at each level of things in a complex system, new emergent structures, they form and engage in new behaviors. So this idea of stacking up agents into more complexity, more complex LLM applications, this is not a new idea. And you know, if you sort of take the tools approach, you can also look at the sort of other side of this, maybe the rules approach. If you're a Stephen Wolfram fan, you may be very familiar with his sort of forays into the science of complexity, even with the very, very simple rules using binary patterns in 2D, you can come up with some extremely complicated, complex behavior. So now we've sort of got these ideas of tools, and rules, but remember, it's not that agents are tools or rules, that they're a pattern. Well, what pattern are they? Well, the best way to think about it in sort of one shot is they are this sort of reasoning action pattern, the react pattern, right? This is from the react paper, October, 2022. And this, this loop, that we're generally using. This reasoning action looping is generally happening where a user submits a question, some sort of query. The LLM decides, mm, do I know the answer to this? If I do, I'm just going to, boom, pop out the answer because I'm an LLM. That's what I do. <clears throat> but if I don't know the answer, I might go and I might select a tool. I might take an action. And these actions you'll notice here, I've got sort of archive, I've got search, I've got Wikipedia, I've got DuckDuckGo. A lot of these are going and they're getting information, they're retrieving information. They're getting reference material from this tool that they're engaging with. It might be proprietary information, it might be current information, but it's sort of deciding and, and doing this reasoning step before it selects some action to take and then make some observation based on that data. Taking that into account, sort of in memory, we're sort of then, okay, do I know the answer or do I need to go select another action to take, another observation to make before I can decide on the final output here? And so we'll loop through as many times as we need to in order to decide, okay, I've got the final response. And the, the agent here is where the reasoning is happening, okay? And, and so the, the sort of pattern here, this, this reasoning action pattern, you can kind of think of it as, as it's a powerful one, two step pattern. Because if you think about a simple scenario, sort of an escape room like scenario, okay, consider this one. You're in the middle of a room looking quickly around you, you see a Cabinet six, a cabinet one, a coffee machine one, a countertop three, a stove burner one, and a toaster one. Your task is to put some pepper shaker on a drawer. If we don't use reasoning and we just simply dumbly act out stuff and, and sort of walk around the room here, go to drawer one, go to drawer one, the drawer one is closed. Open drawer one, you open the drawer one and the drawer one is open. In it, you see a dish sponge two and a spoon one. Go to sink basin one. On the sink basin one, you see a dish sponge three, a spatula one and a spoon two. Take the pepper shaker one from sink basin one, nothing happens. Ooh, what are we going to do next? Nothing happened. Take pepper shaker one from sink basin one. Nothing happens. Oh, oh, stuck in a loop, stuck in a loop. Okay, because we're not thinking, we're not reasoning. But if we think through what's happening before we act things out, think, first I need to find a pepper shaker, more likely to appear in a cabinet. Go to cabinet. On the cabinet, you see a vase. 
Here, the agent goes to cabinet one, then cabinet two, then countertop one and two. Go to countertop three. On the countertop three, you see an apple one, blah, blah, blah. Pepper shaker. Got it. Think. Now I find a pepper shaker. Now I need to put it on a drawer and we can really sort of move through this in a much simpler way. So we're sort of finding the solution, finding the simplicity through the complexity of this reasoning action pattern. Interestingly, importantly for multi-agent systems, LLMs can also assess their own thinking. So this is the idea of self refinement. This is from March, 2023. So, you know, about six months after this react paper came out and this is all about given an input, assess it, make it better based on that assessment. So input, I'm interested in playing table tennis response. I'm sure that's a great way to socialize and stay active. Okay, uh, thanks LLM, but I'm kind of getting uh, kind of jerky vibes from you right now. I think you could be just quite a bit more helpful and uh, more uplifting uh, about my sort of journey into table tennis here. And in fact, I might describe this as not being very engaging or not having very good user understanding of what clearly the person is looking for when they put this in to the dialogue. And so based on the assessment of feedback, in terms of how engaging, how much it understood the user input, you might generate a different response that says, oh, that's great to hear. It's uh, super fun. Um, have you played before? Are you, are you learning how? You know, kind of what can I do for you? I want to be as helpful as possible. And, and in this way, you can actually have the same LLM assess its own output. This is a very powerful pattern because if you then sort of separate these LLMs and give them different personas, different roles, different behaviors and moods, then all of a sudden you've got sort of some specialized LLMs that can look at and assess each other's behavior. And we start to get into this idea of multi-agent systems. Now, if we define the multi-agent system, we're sort of saying, well, there's multiple independent agents, actors, powered by language models connected in a specific way. Multiple, connected, specific. Um, honestly, it's very generic. Why would we do this? Well, part of the reason we would do this is because it's very nice and clean to be able to sort of group tools as well as responsibilities in the same way that we do with job descriptions for humans. Right. We want to sort of set these responsibilities over here, make this person kind of associated with them, make this agent associated with them. And then we can also very nicely separate prompts rather than have one super long context window thing going on. We can we can break this up so it's sort of easy to debug. It's easy to work with. And conceptually, it's just a lot easier, even if you don't necessarily need a bunch of agents to implement your idea. And so this sort of starts to get to the crux of the issue here. Why would you need more than one agent exactly? And again, you know, the, the reason you would need one is probably because there was some seriously specialized things happening that you wanted that agent to look at. So you can start to see how kind of the patterns of fine tuning right? The patterns of prompting start to engage very, very much with the agent pattern. In fact, if I'm specialized, I probably have a manual that I use that defines my discipline. And now we're also into a RAG pattern as well. So there's a, a real key distinction that I want to sort of talk about for a second, um, was if if I'm building a multi-agent system, it's important that we sort of understand that there's the multiple agent system, sort of as the definition would lead us to believe. And then there's like the true multi-agent system. Maybe this isn't a, a an industry standard agreed upon distinction, but it's one we like to make. And you know, what what's your sort of take on this multiple agent versus multi-agent? How should we be thinking about this? 
Yeah, I mean, the, basically, what I think of the the term like multi agent uh, solution or multi agent just in general, uh, I'm typically thinking about things that are you know uh, uh, more than one agent serving the same task or working on the same task, uh, as in you know multi agent rag. Uh, one of the things that I think makes makes the most sense to me is you know, each of the parts of that agentic system are going to be in service of that end goal of RAG. Um, and this is the idea versus multiple agent systems in which we kind of just have, you know, different agents doing their own thing, you know, wh whatever they're, they're, they're happening to do, but they're not working together uh, to, to solve one, one specific uh, cohesive problem. Mm -hmm. I think that's how I would separate the two. So if you're like in a company and everybody's just doing stuff, everybody's sort of off on their own, there's really no like coherent vision of like at the top of the hierarchy of what they're all working towards today. That's more, that's more like this multiple actors doing different things. Whereas if, if you're sort of really aligned in this, in this sort of cohesive unit, right. Where, where you really, moving towards a, a kind of specific output goal. That's really this kind of multi-agent system. That's kind of yeah. the distinction here. Exactly. And and there's there's implications in terms of programmatically how well these things can actually work too. That's sort of the the key here, right? Is 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 like it's actually really hard uh to to sort of get multi-agent systems to like work together to do the thing in comparison to like having a bunch of random multiple agents sort of do their own thing. Right. I mean, it, it makes sense, right? Uh, it does make sense. Yeah. And I think that the key there for, for what you're saying is right. Multi multiple agents, this doesn't necessarily mean that they're, you know, they're, they're working together or not more. So it means like, I just have a bunch of them. Right. Uh, so if I have say, like four agents and they all serve the same goal or have many instances of my one agent, right? That's just multiple agents. They're not, they're not actually designed to work together, quote unquote, communicate and such. They're just designed to each do their own tasks. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. And then I like, I like this idea too, just to sort of bound this, this, this conceptual representation that it like if we had agi like however you define it if we had like a true general intelligence then it, it kind of makes it so like this idea of multiple agents versus just one agent it's like you could kind of just use the the swiss army knight agi agent for kind of every piece of your stack in which case you're really not doing a multi-agent system anymore you're doing sort of a single agi agent system and that's probably good enough right like yeah. like, like uh so, so this it, it's it's a lot to kind of try to grok is this agent thing so so okay in short as we sort of wrap this little discuss here um uh, agent versus multi-agent how's the best way to think about agent versus multi-agent well, you know, at risk of, of sounding like a bit of a fool, I mean, uh, agent is one agent, multi-agent is more than one agent. Uh, you know, it's it's not meant to be uh, too, too much of a joke, but the idea is, is literally that, right? So multi-agents um, are going to use a number of specialized agents, right? So when you're talking about this kind of single AGI, quote unquote, AGI-esque agent, right? I think what you're what you're getting at is there's a, an agent that can adapt to all tasks. Well, currently that's not the case, right? We want to, just like we use prompt engineering, uh, with prompt engineering, you know, we, we want to make sure that we're keeping things super, you know, super specific, uh, not not going too crazy, right? To not, not, asking a, a specific prompt to do like 17 different things. The same is true of uh, agents, right? Where we, we want to build individual specialized agents that are very good at their one task, that use their tools that they're good at using. And then we can have those collaborate with other agents um, in order to, to produce an effective output, right? 
where we're maybe each agent is handling a different part of the stack or h- however you wish to to think about it but that's mm-hmm. the the idea okay all right all right Sweet. Let's see if we can get a handle on this. I mean, there are some frameworks out here that you guys have probably heard of, some tools that you've probably heard of that are trying to make this a little bit easier for us to build with, for us to create with. So Autogen is one of these. And this is from, if you notice the timeline here, this is from Microsoft work in in August 2023. It came out, this paper. And this is all about like building LLM applications via multiple agents that can quote, converse with each other to accomplish tasks. Okay, so this is sort of a conversation framework as stated by stated by the uh, the authors here. But another one you've probably heard of is Crew AI. And Crew AI, check this out, enable agents to assume roles, share goals, ooh, roles and goals, and operate in a cohesive unit, almost like a well-oiled crew. Now, the real interesting thing, whether you're talking about Autogen or you're talking about Crew AI, or you're talking about like LangGraph, which we'll be building with today, but we're not going to bore you with the details of, um, is that none of these are really like no code tools. Like you have to write code for each of these. And, And we're continuing to sort of monitor what the the best sort of low code, no code tools are out there on the market, especially in this sort of multi-agent space. And insofar as we can tell, there really aren't any best practice sort of tools out there today that you don't have to write a a lick of code for that produce really, you know, robust multi-agent system setups. So, you know, it's sort of an emerging space, not sort of, it's very much an emerging space. And it's one that you'll sort of want to get familiar with uh, Probably Crew AI, probably LangGraph, perhaps Autogen, uh, if you're going to jump into it today. So, you know, this idea of of what LangGraph is doing, it's all about this being stateful, right? And a state is just sort of the state of affairs throughout the application, capable of maintaining the status of this process, of this moving through, of this pattern that we have where we're doing reasoning and we're taking actions over and over. So, you know, LangGraph is all about adding cycles to what was built with chains, right? Uh, Lang chain. And so sort of adding that looping to this sort of directed calling of the next step and the next step and the next step. And I uh, highly recommend you guys check out a uh, talk by Harrison Chase on the cognitive architectures in Langchain. We won't go into it today, uh, but we we have are happy to point you in the right direction for other content we've put out on this. And, you know, a single call to a chain of calls to using the LM as a router, which we'll see today, and then uh, actually tracking state. And and the reason why the state machine is very important in short is because it gives you more control than the fully autonomous agent. So you can sort of look for a state to be achieved and then you can, you know, pop it to a human, you can pop it out, you can do something else with it. This is much more useful for enterprise than the full autonomy of these sort of like, you know, fully autonomous agents or whatever. Another way to think about this is like state machines is what people called agents last year all tongue in cheek. And, and, you know, we think about the flows that we can use with, you know, these types of multi-agent setups. There's sort of three types we want you to walk away with today. One is the multi-agent collaboration. One is the hierarchical team. And the, the last one is the agent supervisor. Multi-agent collaboration. I won't bore you with the details of this picture, but share the same context and converse, similar to the Autogen setup. The agent supervisor is going to allow us to sort of have a supervisor that sort of delegates to sort of sub agents. And this is the sort of technique we'll use today. And the team is then sort of stacking the supervisor idea into sort of top level, mid level. And so with that, we're going to show you a demo and welcome everybody to Operation Ocean. Guardian. Okay. So a cargo ship, the SS Meridian has been reported missing for 72 hours in the North Atlantic, an area known for harsh weather and even harsher pirate activity. 
The last known position was transmitted via an emergency beacon and has since gone silent. We're worried about the weather and we want to save the crew. This is, of course, a pilot training simulation that we've built a multi-agent set up for where we have a pilot, a co-pilot, a combat systems operator, and a command and control supervisor. The data that we're using for this is data about the U-28A plane. This bad boy costs about 16.5 mil each. And we're also referencing as we move through our conversation flow and our role playing with the pilot, the co-pilot, and the combat systems operator, the Air Force handbook for airmen. And so the, the situation is thus, we've got our supervisor at the top, the command and control supervisor. We're gonna see what happens when we simulate our pilot training using a multi-agent setup in Langgraf. Wiz, let's see what happened to the lost crew. Yes. Okay. So we've got our uh, we've got our simulation set up here and running. Uh, the The basic idea is straightforward enough. So we've given it this scenario. We've indicated which uh, you know which resources it has access to, the plane that it's flying, the crew of the plane. We have uh, you know our scenario, uh, which is what Greg outlined. We have some objectives for each of our uh, crew members. And the basic idea is it's just going to churn through this, create some text uh, that kind of goes through what we're talking about. So uh, it's going to produce like a role play uh, between the various roles uh, that indicates kind of, you know, what's going on. Each of the agents will handle their own specialized task and or role. So you can see here that our pilot has kicked us off with the mission brief. Uh, you know, the scene begins at a NATO base where the crew is preparing for a mission. Uh, the CSO is stationed at the designated console within the P-8 Poseidon, surrounded by an array of uh, screens and controls. Dedicate, you know, this the, the, the idea is that they're going to have this back and forth. So I've got one that's currently generating. We've got one that's already uh, generated. And yeah, I mean, it, it, it does what you'd expect, right? As the co-pilot, I acknowledge the pilot's communication. Co-pilot, Roger, Poseidon, lead. I have the navigation radar system, I'm monitoring for environmental, and, and so on and so forth. Each of these roles is referencing the uh, the the Air Force uh, handbook, uh, as well as some specifics of their role. So what it means to be their role, uh, what it means to be a, a, a co-pilot versus a CSO versus a pilot. Uh, and that's that's the idea. I mean, each of these is an independent unit. So if we look at how this is actually constructed, you can see that we're using our our lane graph, as Greg mentioned. We have you know the the supervisor, your command and control, tasked with managing an aircraft in conversation between the following crew members: pilot, co-pilot, CSO. Given the following user request, respond with the crew members, uh, the crew member to next act. Right. So. This is that idea of our router, where our supervisor is basically just saying, I've received information, who do I go to next? I've received information, who do I go to next? Over and over again. Uh, this is compiled into a graph, right? Where each of the nodes, so each of the individual agents, which is like a small rag agent, uh, is gonna go back to the command and control supervisor or router uh, agent. And then this is going to rinse and repeat uh, until the such a time as it's determined that this is completed. Now we have a rather open-ended task, which can't actually complete because there is no real ship that's that's lost here, right? But uh, it will keep generating until it feels as though it's reached a satisfying conclusion. So here we have, uh, you know, basically our our co-pilot and pilot uh, talking back and forth along with our CSO. Um, and that's, that's the way it goes. So it, it can't save the, the ship because there is no ship to save, but with some tweaking, with some extra steps, with uh, access to state that might represent that, that, uh, that reality, we can certainly, uh, make this system, you know, mock save a plane, which would be pretty fun. So that's the idea and that's what we've built. And I'll pass you back to Greg. Uh, there you go. All right. Yeah. So this was actually a real use case that one of the students in our class who works for the Air Force 
told us about and is actively trying to sort of drum up some interest and some ability for the Air Force to fund some interesting projects in this regard. Of course, you'd want to connect it to a real flight simulator. Of course, you'd want to potentially even start adding some voice control to it, testing out pilots, and you can actually really go in and assess how well this thing does in terms of how well were the pilots able to maintain situational awareness, which has a strictly defined way of assessing it. And there are a number of ways to sort of enhance this and take it to the next level. And we're excited to see the continued work in this space. The thing about multi-agent applications is it's very hard to find things that truly need the multi-agent application setup. And so, you know, I'm, I'd be curious if any of you know about specific use cases that people are actually implementing that truly need that multi-agent use case to tell us about it. So, you know, remember reasoning action pattern, but also don't forget about rules and tools and self-refine, multi versus multiple, something to keep in mind. There's really not any great low code, no code tools today. You have to write some code for these systems. And then the multi-agent collaboration, the agent supervisor and the hierarchy is a good starting point for you guys to sort of think about grouping tools and responsibilities, separating the prompts and having a great conceptual model. That's a wrap. We're two minutes over. Thank you so much for joining us, guys. We are definitely happy to stick around and answer questions in the chat, but we won't hold you. Thank you for another lightning lesson with us. We'll be back again next month and we'll be talking. We'll... Long context windows kill rag. Let's find out next time on the next lightning lesson. Thanks, everybody. And that is a wrap.